Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Before I get too far into this, does everybody know what this is? Fire extinguisher, right? Does anybody know how to use this? David, I sure hope you do because you're front row. You're in the splash zone. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set this over here near you. And then you're going to be equipped to do good works. Because I've been told I could burst into flames at any moment. And that would be nice if you're equipped to put me out. It has nothing to do with the message. It's just something that's a safety precaution. Today we're going to continue in our four-week series called Back to the Basics. It's a series about the basics, the foundations of our faith. And if you were with us last week, you recall that we began with the practice of consistent and bold prayer. The big idea is that the Bible has been given to us as a tool to equip and encourage us in kingdom living in the world. Spending intentional time reading and meditating on scripture is the daily sustenance that we need as followers of Christ. Our journey continues today with the very Word of God, the Holy Scripture. It may seem like such an obviously important part of Christian faith, yet for some reason, the Bible is all too often overlooked, even ignored in our daily lives. And with that, I just want to open in a little prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, please give us a hunger for the bread of life, the Word made flesh, the Scriptures. Father, please encourage us to make space and time to meet with you in your word every day. And lastly, Lord, we lift up Israel this morning that you would keep your hand of protection, your hedge of protection around them as they face yet more onslaughts from the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's said that the purpose of knowing scripture is to know God more so that you can love him more. Did you know... That the Bible was the first printed book in Western civilization. Now, it wasn't the first printed book because the first printed books were actually in the East. But in the West, it was the first one. Did you know that as of 2022, the entire Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, has been translated to some 724 languages? Sounds like a lot. Did you know that the New Testament has been translated to 1,617 languages with another 1,248 languages partially translated? And that is out of, and this astounded me, out of 7,388 known languages. It is far and away the most published book, the most translated book, the most interpreted book ever. Currently, with some 5 to 7 billion copies known to exist as well it also happens to be the most stolen book out of hotels out of hospitals out of any number of places maybe the pew in front of you but no matter we're not worried about that if you want to take it you just take it home we have more and you want to know why it's because it's alive it's active it has power it's effective and it's useful have you ever read the bible and something just jumps out at you. As if the Bible knew what you needed at that moment. Or have you ever just randomly opened to a passage that spoke so clearly into your life that just seemed uncanny? Well, if you've ever felt either of those things before, then you're right. The writer of Hebrews describes the words of Scripture as both alive and active. Hebrews 4.12 tells us, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divide soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That one verse says an awful lot about Scripture. But for starters, let's just look at two words in there, alive and active. To be alive, in this sense, means to be counted among the living, not the dead. The point being here, the writer of Hebrews is very much counts the words of Scripture among the living, just as human beings and animals and such. The word active also means effective and productive in its work. And I think we can all agree that the Bible is both living and effective. And to drive the point home, the author of Hebrews says the word is more effective than a double-edged sword at dividing, cutting through soul and spirit. The word is powerful and able to get down to the very heart of any matter. Billy Graham often discounted his ability as a preacher, always pointing to the power of scripture as the source of his effectiveness in his crusades and 
most of us know he led millions to the Lord. While putting this message together, I started to wonder about things like, I wonder how much time people really spend in God's word. In contrast, I wonder how much time people spend on social media, TV, and, and other things. Some of the stats are astounding. According to various sources, fewer than 11% of Christians spend about 30 minutes a week reading the Bible. In tragic contrast, studies in 2022 established that people average 151 minutes a day on social media. Studies also indicated that the average American watches three plus hours of TV a day. Other studies reflected that an average American checks their mobile device up to 150 times, nine times a day. Another stat pointed to media gaming and that for the many people who are into the media gaming, they're playing as much as four plus hours a day. And people spend an average of 31 minutes a day on Facebook alone. These are probably not healthy, productive habits. And it's certainly a disappointing reflection on how people allot so little time for their spiritual health and growth. In contrast to pittering away precious life and nonsense. You're probably all familiar with the acronym BIBLE. Who can help me with this? B, BIBLE? Basic. What is it? Basic, right? Instructions? Before? Leaving Earth. Earth. Right. Very good. Very good. Bravo. Okay. Can you imagine trying to wade through life without the Bible? Can you imagine having a toy or, or some tools or some furniture that has like thousands of parts that you have to put together with no instructions at all? Kind of like that. Only much worse. But beyond, beyond the obvious things that we all know about Scripture being God's revelation of Himself, creation, us, our relationship with Him and Him with us, our fall, our redemption, salvation, sanctification, and ultimately glorification, etc., etc., there is so much sheer beauty in Scripture. I'm particularly a fan of Psalm 19 that exemplifies the beauty of Scripture. And I'm going to try to read this. And I've got to go faster because I'm already going too slow. Dave, you got the fire extinguisher ready? All right, good. Here we go. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making the wise simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgressions. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock, my redeemer. You don't find beauty like this on reality TV shows. You don't find it on social media. You won't find it in video games. And you sure won't find it just tinkering around with your phones. You do find it abundantly in the Bible. It's healthy, it's wholesome, and it's at our fingertips. But we must take action to receive it. Which leads us into our message. Growing in God's word. One. The habit of growth in God's word. Since you were a child, I read from 2 Timothy 
through 17. Since you were a child, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise. That wisdom leads to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for showing people what is wrong in their lives, for correcting faults, for teaching how to live right. Using the scriptures, the person who serves God will be capable having all that is needed to do every good work. There's quite a lot packed into this passage that we should reflect on. For instance, Scripture is able to make you wise. And that wisdom leads to salvation through Christ Jesus. Scripture is useful for teaching, for showing people what is wrong, for correcting faults, teaching how to live right. Using Scriptures with the Holy Spirit gives us all that is needed to do every good work. And let that one sink in just for a moment. Using scriptures with the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit gives us all that is needed to do every good work. We are wise to recognize and embrace the truths of this passage. Value them and importantly, seek to develop the habit of spending deliberate discipline time in God's word daily. It's precious what we've received. What we have at our fingertips. There are so many places in the world you get executed just for having a Bible. And we have the freedoms here. We have the privileges of not only having it, not only being able to gather and study it and share. Like we have so many great small groups here. Don't fritter these opportunities away, especially for what's out there and what apparently we all spend way too much time with. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. Psalm 119, 72. Stephen Covey wrote, why habits are important. Sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. So how do we form and keep a habit? Behavioral psychology suggests that your life today is essentially the sum of your habits. For instance, how in shape or out of shape you are. A result of your habits. How happy or unhappy are you? A result of your habits. How successful or unsuccessful are you? A result of your habits. What you repeatedly do, in other words, what you spend your time thinking about and doing each day, ultimately forms the person you are. The things you believe and the personality you portray. But what if you want to improve? What if you want to form new habits? How do you go about that? Turns out there's a helpful framework that can make it easier for you to stick to new habits so that you can improve your health, your work, your life in general, and importantly, your spiritual health and growth. The science of how habits work is pretty interesting. The process of building a habit can be divided into four simple steps. Cue, craving, response, and reward. Breaking it down into these fundamental parts can help us understand what a habit is, how it works, and how to improve it. First, there's the cue. The cue triggers your brain to initiate a behavior. It is a bit of information that predicts reward. Certainly, a major reward of the habit of reading scriptures is to go closer to the Lord and the Lord closer to us. Cravings are the second step of the habit loop. And they are motivational force behind every habit. Without some level of motivation or desire, without craving a change, we have no reason to act. How many of us wish we were better versed in the Bible? How many of us wish we were more confident in sharing our faith and sharing Christ with others? The Bible makes it clear we should be ready to share at any time. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but to do this with gentleness and respect. The third step is the response. The response is the actual habit you perform, which can take the form of a thought or an action. In this case, it is thought and action. Whether a response occurs or depends on how motivated you are, on how much friction is associated with the behavior. For example, do you prioritize your relationship with God and take action? Will you put down the remote? Will you stay off the keyboard? Will you turn off the TV? Will you put away your phone and take the time 
and spend with the Lord. Finally, the response time delivers a reward. Rewards are the end goal of every habit. The cue is about noticing the reward. The craving is about wanting the reward. The response is about obtaining the reward. We chase rewards because they serve two purposes. They satisfy us and they teach us. Is this not exactly what we're hoping for? To find that satisfaction in maturing in our faith and learning. In summary, the cue triggers a craving, which motivates a response, which provides a reward, which satisfies the craving, and ultimately comes back and loops back around to the cue, the craving, the response, and the reward. And this is how we develop automatic habits. Habits are a part of growth and transformation. Ways we can grow in his word are covered in much more depth in our 201 class. And if you've, you're part of us here and, and you haven't yet obtained either the 101 or the 201 classes that we offer, I strongly encourage you to do so. Come and join us. You will not regret it. For example, as we do this, there is things like reading, studying scripture, memorizing scripture, meditating, applying, listening, sharing with others, and practicing what you learn. Which might beg the question, how to read God's word. I don't know that there's a blanket response to that, but scripture tells us that his word shall be our constant companion. We must read from it every day of our lives. We eat every day, we drink every day. Apparently, we do all kinds of nonsense every day. We need to incorporate Scripture every day into our lives. Some suggest a systematic reading plan. For example, a plan could be reading and meditating in our daily bread. A lot of us might be familiar with that. You can find it online, all kinds of different places, our daily bread. You can also find it in print form. Another good one is my utmost for his highest. That's one of the ones I happen to read and, and really enjoy every day. There's Upper Room. There's Version apps. There's Bible in a Year app. There's lots of different apps that can just help you facilitate reading through it. And by the way, it's often very beneficial to read from different translations as well as reading it out loud. When I was in seminary, one of the assignments that we had was finding any passage, any given passage, and, and reading it in different translations of the Bible. Reading it in the most formal, perhaps the King James, and then less formal and less formal, New American Standard, NIV, NLT, all these different translations. But read it in every translation... And then decide what really spoke to you. What really reached out. Man, that made the most sense when I read it out of that translation. Well, the chances are that's the translation you should kind of stick with. Let the Spirit work with you. Work with the Spirit. Let Him lead you. It's also great to have an accountability partner. And I can't say enough about that. Because when you have an accountability partner, whether it's the person next to you here at church, or whether it's a friend at work, whether it's somebody at home, whether it's somebody on the other side of the world, if you have an accountability that you're like reading through a book of the Bible together, and that you support and encourage each other, it results in, in great things. And what is the result of the habit of spending time in God's Word? What might be a reward? Spiritual maturity, which takes us into point two. And I've got to go a lot faster. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That might be a simple enough passage. Looking at it deeper than simply the surface, consider as a disciple, if you will, holding to the teaching of Jesus and really being his disciple. Anybody here watch any of the Chosen series? Yeah, yeah right. Can't you connect? I, 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 you know, it's not always correct, right? But it doesn't matter. It's a great series, and, it, and it's edifying in one case or another. But can you imagine being one of those disciples and following Jesus, you know, through all of these experiences? It's, it's really, man, it's just pretty cool. But in any case, um, we will know then, though, getting back to the point, the truth. And who is the truth? Scripture tells us who is the truth. Jesus is the truth. And the truth will set you free. Jesus will set you free. Friends, the Scripture points to Jesus everywhere. As you read Scripture, no matter if it's Old Testament, New Testament, it doesn't matter where you're at. 
It should tell you something about yourself. It should tell you about Jesus. It should always be pointing to Jesus. It's important for us to understand that as disciples, we should be seeking to grow past spiritual infancy to a deeper level of maturity. Why? For one, spiritual maturity results in unity. Ephesians 4 speaks of unity and maturity in the body of Christ. To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature in attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4. Are we not being shaped? Are we not being molded to the likeness of Christ? Romans 8 tells us, from the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him should become like his son. As the Holy Spirit leads us in our calling, let us walk in humility and alertness. Let us commit to being lifelong learners and to grow in our faith, allowing Jesus to mature us into his likeness day by day. Those are words from Linus Franklin. But these things will not happen on their own accord, and we need to be acutely aware that we are to grow past our spiritual infancy and being complacent in our growth. Hebrews 6 provides us very specific instructions. So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. But it's not automatic. It is a process. Proverbs 8.5 directs us, learn to be mature. 2 Peter 3.18 tells us, continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior Jesus Christ. It is a challenge. It takes self-discipline and God's power. But be encouraged. 2 Timothy 1.7 tells us, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power. Love and self-discipline. It also requires a spirit. Romans 8.13 tells us, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Friends, we clearly need his spirit to grow and bear fruit. Colossians 1 tells us that the spirit gives wisdom and understanding so that we may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father. So again, if you've ever read the Bible and it seemed to be speaking directly into your heart, into your life, into your situation, then I think it's fair to say it probably was. And as we grow in our faith, it's important to continue returning to scripture again and again submitting ourselves to the word of God and allowing the spirit to work in and through our lives which takes us to number three applying God's word Colossians 2 6 and 7 tells us therefore as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord so walk with him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving John 13, 17 tells us, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. It's obviously important that we are not simply to walk, to talk, to talk, but to walk, to walk. So how might it be best to apply scripture to our walk? It's important to grasp the context of the passage. For instance, to whom was it written and by whom? What were the circumstances? What are the precise meanings of the words in the original language? What related scriptures might provide additional insights? What is the timeless principle? Where or how could I practice that principle? Or put simpler, who wrote it? What was happening? What made him write the passage? And how does this apply today? Friends, if you search, you will find. Cross-referencing scripture. What scripture does this passage cross-reference to. One of the beautiful things, and I don't know if you ever saw this chart, it shows, it, it just looks like crazy, like a spirograph. Remember having spirographs when you were maybe younger, right? It's kind of a chart like that, and it has all the scripture of the Bible and how it cross-references to each other. Scripture supports scripture everywhere you turn. 
And one of my favorites is how does scripture, whatever you're studying, how does it point to Christ? What are we to learn? Growing God's worth must always, always, always center on Christ. An all important first step, of course, is to have Christ received into our heart, into our lives as our Lord and Savior. Surrendering all to him. And if you have not done so yet, today is the day. Maybe there's been a little tug. Maybe there's something in your life. Maybe there's a hole that you just can't find a way to fill. Jesus will fill it. I invite you to join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, help us to develop the habit of learning your word, to be equipped for every good work that glorifies you. Help us to develop and mature in your word, that we might continue to grow in your likeness according to your will. Father, please guide us to apply your word correctly in our lives every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now we close with our final.